Yes, and the good players, even the ones who are the great players, they go, you know, I mean, if I could get that one walk, well, I didn't walk. So it's either right. 0 for 4, most of the time it's 0 for 4, or 1 for 4, but most of the time it was 0 for 4. Yep. And it's kind of hard to sleep. And they go, wow, you know, make all that money. No, you don't understand. It's because we care. That's right. It's because we care. We're not thinking about money. We're thinking about getting hits and performing. And but once you get that SAB, yeah. you feel good. Yeah, you feel yeah. real good. Welcome to the podcast. It's Talk and Chop with Coach Ballgame, Coach Chop, and Tommy Gold, our producer. Mm. Hey, Chad Chop, how you doing, brother? Man, I'm good, Coach Ballgame. Excited to be here with you. Excited for today's guest. And uh, you're you're wearing something right now that's alluding to the guest today. For the listener out there not watching on YouTube, um, it, it, this is a Chicago Cubs jersey. And it happens to have the ball game on the back, number eight, because mm. that was my number, because my favorite player growing up wore number eight, Andre Dawson. Uh, and, you know, this is a subtle flex, but when I threw out the first pitch at Wrigley, they gave me this uniform. So is that a subtle flex or just no straight big deal. up? Is that, is that a blatant flex? That's a, that's a double arm back to the crowd looking over the left shoulder flex. And that's Oh, what flex. do you know? Here's the ball with a little bit of the dirt from the pitcher's mound inside the glass case. Whoops. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm not obsessed with the day, but there's the picture of it as well. Oh my. Well, and, all subtlety and, has gone out the window, Coach Bogan. I mean, th th this is going to be uh, – go ahead and tell them. Who's our guest today, Coach Chad Chop? Shaywan Dunstan. Sean Dunstan. So the eight-year-old me sitting on my living room floor – um, consuming gallons of applesauce while watching an entire Cubs game. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to be Mr. Fanboy today. I'm going to try and tone it down as much as I can because he's had a, a long career beyond Chicago. Uh, yeah. but you know what that that's where it all began for me was watching Dunstan throw the ball faster than anybody humanly could across the diamond over to Mark Grace. Uh, turning double plays with the Rhino, um, you know, driving in Andre Dawson with a with an RBI double against Doug mm -hmm. Drayback in 1990, like all of that stuff. It makes my mouth water, makes my heart palpitate, um, and like you said, gives me a little uptick in that happiness. So, how'd you meet uh, Sean, and, and what what can you say about him? Number twelve, Sean Dunstan. Man, I, I there's too many words to describe Sean, um, but one thing I want to say. Uh, we were partners uh, with the Giants, so we were both on staff together, and uh, he treated me like an equal, you know, he treated me like a peer, which is pretty cool, and he didn't have to, because here's a man with 20 years of big league experience, just as a player, and then another 10 to 12 to 15 years as a coach at that time, um, and he treated me like, you know, like his friend, like his colleague, uh, the cool, one of the cool things, when we first did replay in spring training, uh, we were sitting there and it was a few days before March 21st, which is my birthday. And uh, I said, Hey, Sean, what do you got going for your, you know, what do you got going this weekend? He goes, well, it's my birthday on Monday. And I go, wait, what, what? I go, it's, it's, it's my birthday on Monday. He goes, no, I go, yeah. So we're, we're birthday brothers. We have the same Come on birthday, March 21st. Oh my goodness. Yeah. March 21, 321. And, and, and you shared, you shared a room with him for a while there in San Francisco dialing in, uh, instant replay. Uh, it, peel back the curtain there, man. What's it like sitting a whole nine innings with with that baseball mind? I mean, you have Sean Dunstan, and then he was teammates with Barry Bonds, so Barry would come in and uh, sit with us. So you got subtle flex. Subtle you got flex. Barry. You got Sean Dunstan. You got Will Clark that would come in a lot and sit with us. Come on, so, come on. So, I, so I'm just getting a master class right about hitting and approach with will clark and how important it is to drive the ball the other way and uh yeah it, sean's the best and he has these teammates that respect him that want to spend time with him and you know i got a little secondhand respect just because i was boys with sean so uh pretty cool pretty amazing uh pinch yourself when you think about those moments when you're with baseball royalty and uh it's pretty cool just try to be a sponge 18 year major league career, Cubs, Giants, Pirates, Cleveland, Cardinals, Mets, two time All Star, uh, born in Brooklyn, had a 790 batting average his senior year of high school. Yeah. I I've never heard of that. 
seven number one yeah number one overall pick in the country 1982 how about it still can throw 90 still can throw 90 from short today no doubt about it and um there was a rating back in the day like uh, of of your throwing arm Uh, who had the best throwing arm of all time and they actually had some kind of scientific rating for it um and a four is a very strong arm a five or a 50 was elite and then a 60 was um unmatched it was a perfect throwing arm two people were rated with that 60 throwing arm rating sean dunstan can you guess the other uh can you give me the position right field that makes sense around the same time or this guy come in a little bit after sean earlier 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 Uh, than sean roberto clemente correct clemente and dunstan and that's a little foreshadowing on uh some more trivia we are definitely going with some dunstan trivia today you versus uh sean uh chad shop how do you think you're gonna fare you 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 did not beat joe buck it wasn't even close uh how are you gonna do today i mean i feel good i got a good night's sleep uh ate ate some breakfast and uh feel pretty clear-minded i'll finish in the top two for sure outstanding guarantee and again listener if you're not watching great new haircut for chad shop um Thank you. I've heard there's there's listeners that are 18 years old out there. there. There's listeners that are 12 years old listening to this with their mom and their dad. Um, to all of you listening, and, and and thank you for the feedback and the emails. And you know, I see a lot of people at the Sandlot. Man, loved loved Blake Trine and loved Kike Hernandez. Loved listening to you and Joe Buck talk. Uh, my dad absolutely loved the Joe Buck. Um, you know, just it's pretty cool that that people of all ages grandpas grandmas parents kids they're all listening to it so add a boy chad it's great and it's a it's a powerful message it has to be spread and uh it's just follow you know we, we got to get back to being kind to each other and we got to get back to what really matters which is being nice and kind and having fun and joy and just you know treating others an umpire you know if they quote unquote wronged us they're doing their best but we can still treat them with respect and love and respectfully disagree. That's okay. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's powerful. I'm glad people are hearing it. Tell your friends. I love it. I love it. Well, before Sean comes on, I had a topic. I got an email uh, from a, a parent who you know wanted to basically have a therapy session with me. Uh, their kid just thrives in practice, uh, batting practice, you know, you know, has fun. But once the game uh, begins, it's like a different person. And this performance anxiety uh, shows up. And I, I haven't seen it in the past five years all that much because I've been running, you know, laid back sandlot games, very fun for the, for the newcomer. But when I was doing private lessons, it, it was, I felt like I, half my job was just being a therapist because yep. I would watch, I would watch this young ball player with me, just me uh, and a mound and and a catcher's mitt and just throw bullet after bullet right to my mitt just look beautiful then i watched them in the game and it looked like a different version of that person it, it looked like somebody else same for any other skill that, that uh, you might have so this this practice version of a player versus the game version and i have thoughts on the matter on performance anxiety why it happens and how we can um kind of help young players through it um I even have adult friends that that struggle with this. Maybe it's in golf where they just crush it on the range, but you get into the game and and it it's a different feel. The heartbeat is different. So uh, I'll I'll let you lead off there. When you hear performance anxiety, what comes to mind for you? I'm writing down notes as you're speaking because I have a few things uh, that help. Uh, and I had a little bit of this with a kid this weekend. Uh, one of my athletes at the high school, who's a very good athlete very good athlete and he's taking batting practice and he's getting frustrated after the first swing you could see it in his body language you could see that he was outside of the the moment outside of the here and now and he was worried about his first swing on his fourth swing right so as coaches as soon as his round ended i i walked over to him away from everyone else and uh i just said hey so and so that's not his name but so and so um i believe in you 
and you have a ton of talent. You're going to do great things on this field and off this field. And you've got to be able to breathe and just relax and take a deep breath. This is a very hard game. Michael Jordan can tell you how hard it is to hit a baseball, right? And so uh, I just wanted to get him back into like, hey, you, you, I'm already impressed with you. And I want you to breathe. And I want you to fall in love with how difficult this game is. And then you give yourself a chance. So that's the first thing is make sure as coaches, we set realistic expectations and we make sure these kids know, Hey dude, I believe in you. Like you, you just gotta be you. You don't have to do anything more than what God made you. Like you be you and, and that's more than enough for what we need. Right. The second thing is identify your areas of growth. And even in that, we said that positively, right? Cause most people say, Oh, you got to fix your, what your weaknesses, right? No, no identify your areas of growth and make them your strengths. So we all have strengths and most of us want to play to our strengths. That's why you and I are on TV right here at the internet because we're handsome, right? But that's just, yeah, that's just, that's human nature. But here's the thing, you got to identify your areas of growth and work on them. And if you can turn those into strengths or at least par for the course, then we got action, right? So that's the second thing. The third thing is after you do that, I guess it's just piggybacking on that. You have that confidence through preparation. And this is, I think, a key for young athletes is they want to be, you know, uh, Pat Mahomes or they want to be Matthew Stafford. They want to be Kobe Bryant. But uh, I believe it was Jay-Z that once said when Kobe scored 65 at Madison Madison Square Garden, he was working his tail off before the game that night, right? So you got to put in the work, you got to put in the work. And if you want to be really elite, you got to put in that work and that will give you the confidence through preparation. That's really good. One, two, three. I like it. Let's, let's break down number one first. What, what I heard from you was fall in love with how difficult this game is. You are enough. Just you showing up and you being is enough. And that's what your team needs from you. Um, Falling in love with how difficult this game is That's all about the journey and the process and making that, that, um, uh, that love that you can uh, garner for this journey. That's the win, right? Yes. That's W I N that's winning is, um, fouling that fouling your pitch off three, four, five times in a row, swinging and missing on, on that pitch that, that you just can't seem to get to, but then, wanting to go back and do it again tomorrow, like falling in love with how difficult this game is that, that was, that was well, well put young man. Thank you very much. Coach Chad chop. Uh, and then identifying those areas of growth and preparing two and three. Um, uh, what I, what I think of uh, when someone has performance anxiety is one, they're afraid uh, to be sh- to be shamed for their failure. They're, 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 they're afraid of uh, either being yelled at after the game by a parent or during the game by a coach or even a teammate, right? And sometimes the yelling, it's throw strikes. Like it, 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 can, it, you, it can be said in a positive way even, throw strikes, but it still has this, um, it has this pressure-filled vibe to it that is not great for the the moment. So uh, let's say you're in the dugout, Coach Chad Chop, and you see a pitcher who's been dialed in in practice, boom, 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 and then he throws seven straight balls, um, and you start to hear a few things from the either the bleachers or uh, from the dugout from his teammates. Uh, it, it could be anywhere. Um, uh, you're what are you going to do in that moment um to calm that player down kind of turn down the volume of that performance anxiety and um you know what what can a coach out there do likewise uh, a couple things my tone's positive uh Tone. the words co- the words coming out of my mouth are positive um hey so and so nobody better right hey nobody better right here take a deep breath slow down your pace your pace take a deep breath and win the moment Right. So just these little cues of, first of all, breathe, you know, instilling confidence. There's nobody better. Or maybe I'll touch on a, maybe he's just rolling through his balance point. Like, hey, hit your balance point. Hey, hit your balance point. No one's better. Your pace, take a deep breath, win the moment, win the moment, get that vibe back into them of, hey, I just got to win the moment. You know, Mm -hmm. oftentimes it's, hey, one pitch away, 
you're one pitch away. Like they get that ground ball, we can get a double play. So just, and that we got that from, from coach Showalter too, right? Buck Showalter yep. when, uh, when Hundo was on. So it's just, as coaches, we get to decide how we attack that. The kid's doing his best and he's stressed and his heart rate's elevated and he's worried about all the things you touched on. So it's our job in that moment to, hey, breathe. You know, even the tone is calming. I'm not screaming it, you know? And they're looking over at you like, coach, what do I do? Hey, you got this. There's no one better. Hit your balance point, you know, focus on the glove. We can say all kinds of things, but more importantly, how do you say it? And remind them to win the moment. Moment is where, being in the moment, that's where the success lies. You've already thrown three balls. You don't get them back. Right? I love that. I love that. So that's for the player that's going through the performance anxiety. I also think about the culture that a coach must set um, for the whole team and the parents during these moments. When, when that performance anxiety is happening, when a player just doesn't seem themselves, um, for me, you can't give the player the opportunity to be afraid of failing. You can't give them that chance. And, and how do you give a player an opportunity to fear failure? By yelling, by, by uh, kind of giving them an ultimatum or a consequence for, for messing up. Um, whereas you say, win the moment, nobody better, right? These small little cues of positivity. I want my, I want my players to rally behind this this ball player or these ball players that are struggling and go up to them, give them a fist bump, let them know this is normal. This happens all the time. Um, and then as a coach, relate to the parents, you want these kids to embrace failure. You want them to be so free to fall flat on their face and not feel shamed for messing up. Um, uh, it, 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 it should be it just, it should, there should be this freedom to, to take those chances and, and, and go all out and yeah, embrace that failure, fall in love with how difficult this game is. I just love that quote. So um, anything uh, else to hit on, maybe an email to, to the parents, uh, how would you get that point across to build that culture to your team and the parents of that team um, that we're not going to be afraid of failure. And, and, and this is how we approach performance anxiety. Well, Mike, the culture that I set and uh, you set it from day one is, is we're, how are we going to respond? So we're always looking for a response. doesn't matter what happens to us. The team that is most resilient in a competitive match, it's in my belief is that's the team who's going to prevail is we're going to make mistakes. We're going to, we're going to, you know, make errors and strike out and all that stuff. Okay. How are you going to respond? I talked about Pablo Sandoval, where he made an error in Milwaukee, then he had a three-run homer. You know, so it's like I create the vibe, and as teammates, we create the vibe of like, so what? Now what? Watch this, and we almost get excited when something wrong happens because we're conditioned as a group and as individuals to watch this. You know, when our back's against the wall, watch, and and that's the vibe that's set. Now, when it comes to parents. I don't really have to address much because the kids already know the vibe's set. They can feel it. They, they can sense and feel the vibe from the dugout, from the field. There's no panic. There's no stress. Every once in a while, I have to address it with a parent. But just like when you address something with, with your athlete, it's one-on-one. -on -one and it's, hey, I know you love your son. And I love your son. And I know that these things that you're yelling and saying are out of love. But we're not going to do that anymore. And you love your son too much. And I'm just, you know, it sounds different than what you think it sounds like. And that's not what we're about. And, they, and they're in because they know, they agree. We all love these kids. The parents love them more than we do as coaches. So when you, when you bring it to them like that, they're like, yeah, shoot, man. I just, you know, I just want what's best for them. Yeah, 100%. So let's, I got you. <laughs> I got you. I think, yeah. and I think there's a lot of different reasons why kids um, that maybe don't perform in the big moment. Uh, you know, there's the practice version in the game. Sometimes, yes, they're just they're afraid of their parent uh, getting mad at them on the car ride home. Some of them, their parents are very quiet. Their parents are, are, are in tune with um, with with staying chill during the big moment and, and quietly critiquing and, and quietly um, identifying areas of growth, which another another great way of saying that. But, yeah, sometimes. Um, Sometimes you, you don't have the answer as a parent or a coach to why you can't pinpoint what, what is going on here. 
and you just have to empty out your tool pouch and you just have to keep keep grinding uh, uh, you know i think of hunter pence how he uh, the way he approached baseball is he wanted the other team to feel him is that right have and, the defense and feel you yeah love that feel you right and that's all about grinding and and having that c- controlling the controllables so um i uh i really i really dig the, the words you use there and and the maybe the most key word was t o n e tone the tone is so, so important. I can remember back when I was, um, you know, struggling on the mound and I had a, I had a nice calm tone. It, it, it was just a, a short positive note um, uh, that made such a difference. Meanwhile, anytime my shortstop, who I looked up to because he was the best player on the team, anytime he'd say, come on, James, throw strikes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that I just got icky and, and uh, I, I felt like I couldn't feel the ball and it just the, the freedom wasn't there to to let it rip. So coaches, parents out there, give your uh, give your kiddos the chance to let it rip and be free to fail and fall flat on your face um, and fall in love with how difficult this game is. That is awesome. Awesome. Speaking of short stops, uh, we have a legendary shortstop here right now that I would love to introduce uh, Mr. Sean Dunstan. He played 18 years in the big leagues, two-time all-star, another just tremendous human that I'm so proud to call a friend, a colleague, and uh, Sean, welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you. Thank you, Chop. How you doing? Man, good. Good to be here. Doing good. So we got a big, you got a big Chicago fan in coach ball game. So uh, I'm going to let him <laughs> talk to you for a few minutes. I promise. Question. I promise Chad. Okay. I would not, I would not, uh, I would not go cubby fanboy too much, <laughs> but I must say uh, growing up in North Carolina where WGN was, was one of our only channels. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would come home from school every day and there's one team playing in the afternoons. I'd make a big bowl of applesauce. I'd watch an entire Cubs game uh, from start to finish uh, from about the, the years of 86 all the way to 94, which is right in your wheelhouse. And um, the consumption of applesauce and, and Harry Carey isms um, <laughs> is, is so deep in, embedded in me. And it, it's where it all started for me. So uh, mm-hmm. I loved watching you play. You, you taught me uh, what a shortstop should look like and how a shortstop should smile and uh, what a, and what a great mustache looks like. So um, I, I, it's an honor to meet you and just hearing uh, Chopper talk about his time with you uh, in San Francisco. Uh, um, Now, what, what a great, what a great man you are. He speaks so highly of you. So uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I have no problem with that. Thank you. I appreciate Chop. And I feel the same way about Chop. I just look at myself as this ordinary person. I just happen to play baseball. That's all. I love it. I I I love uh, getting to dive in on some stats. And I'll yeah. I'll throw out the first question. But I mean, folks, he batted seven ninety his senior year in high school. Seven ninety. That's basically eight out of ten. Uh, 10 bombs, 37 stolen bases. Like you said, Chopper, number one overall pick in 1982. Um, uh, I guess where I want to start with you is, is when did you know, yep, baseball's it for me. I, I love this game, and, and I think I can make a career out of it. Was it early on? Did you play multiple sports? Well, I play all the sports, but I just love baseball. There's something about baseball I knew it. About eight years old, I remember I'm telling my parents, I want to be a baseball player. And they say, okay, son, you got to work hard. I said, I promise you, I'm going to be a baseball player. And my dad said, you just can't be saying you're going to do these things. So um, my dad and I was playing catch. And every time I play catch, I try to break his hand. I try to show him. And he looks at me and goes, whoa, you can throw. So he said, well, it's more than baseball than just throwing. I said, well, you'll see. And we just worked at it, worked at it. And I played and I made it. Now, in high school, yes, I was very good. It was like I was... um. I'm Barry Bonds. I was a man, Mike Trout in high school. So yes, I'm proud of that. But um, you know, it's, it wasn't as hard as in the in um in, 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 in MLB. But um, I was pretty good in high school. And then I got um to the minor leagues. Then I got introduced to the slider. Then the yep. game became a little harder. It became much harder. 
like, like I always tell Chop, I told him, um, man, rookie ball was easy. Then I went to A ball, it was easy. Then I went to double A, I skipped high A, went to double A, then triple A, I did well. I was there for two and a half months. The first day I hit two homers. And the first week I had five homers. So I said, oh, I'm going to the big leagues right away. I'm ready now. And then I got introduced to the slider. <laughs> <laughs> And then the game became a little more difficult, but I still enjoyed myself. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed watching you play and, and um, it, it was fun seeing you try to break Mark Grace's hand over there, throwing a shortstop <laughs> like you broke your, your dad's hand. That, that is so funny. You know, every, every dad wants to play catch with their son, but your dad's getting his hand broken. <laughs> it's yeah. So great. I love that. I mean, oh. I just love to throw. It was like, um, I wasn't a flipper. I'm not smooth like the other shortstops in the big leagues now. I'm not smooth. I'm rough, but like they always say, if you have it, use it. And I used it. I I'm, I got to meet Ozzie Smith. And the one thing I noticed about him, and he he was a bit of a flipper, was right. this part of his forearm. It was yeah. just double the size of mine. It was about the size of my leg. Yeah. Uh, was this the place where you had that, that power? Was it the whole arm? I think it's the whole arm and body. I threw it my whole body. Yeah. I use my arms and my legs, but I usually use my legs. And that's mm -hmm. what makes my arm come through much quicker. I use my legs. That's why they wanted me to be a pitcher. I'm like, no, I'm not going to be no pitcher. I want to play every day. And I remember one day in spring training and, um, you know, man, during the season, Lee Smith said, hey, Sean, you're making errors and you ain't getting the hit. You know what? You keep making errors, you know, the, I mean, the Cubs need a setup, man. You may be my setup, man. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> so I said, no, Lee, I'm going to get it together, Lee. But I'm not going to be a pitcher. I, I, I enjoy hitting on pitches, but I couldn't be a pitcher. It, it's really hard to be a pitcher. Anybody could just throw 95 straight, straight, straight for about two or three pitches. But for the whole game, with a change up slide, a curve, you know, I have a lot of respect for them. Now I do since I'm not playing them. I didn't want to tell them that. Love it. Love it. Lee Smith wanted you to be his setup, man. That is great. Yeah. All so right, much Chopper. Much. Back to yeah. you. He, uh, I love what Sean said about moving his feet. So young, young athletes out there and Brandon Crawford, we had him on about a month ago and he said the same thing. He said his footwork is the most important part of his defense. So our listeners out there, especially the players and the coaches, your footwork matters. Everyone just wants to watch the upper half, but that lower half Sean said was a big part of his bazooka arm. So that that's great pop. Uh, yes, question, you. question I have for you: uh, Who are your favorite shortstops to watch in the game today? Oh, shop! You know I'm a baseball fan. I love all the shortstops. For anybody who know me, Brandon Crawford is my favorite. Yep, hands down. I don't care. He's my favorite. But I love all the shortstops. Then I like this other shortstop. I told Chop we was playing the Dodgers. I said, Chop, this guy's going to be a stud. You can wait till this big dude. He's the Cal Ripken now. Mm. But like when I play, he's Kyle Ripken now. And with Seager, and I'm going, whoa, this guy is good. I like Baez because I'm a Cub. Mm -hmm. I play like him. I like Tim Anderson. I play like him. But he's a much better hitter than they all. I mean, he, I mean, he doesn't walk, and he hits 330. I hit 330 for like two months, and then I fell out the tree. So I really <laughs> like him. I like, I like um, Story. I like um, Correa. I like Baez. I like all the shortstops. I'm yeah. a fan of all the shows but i'm really impressed with marcus Simeon because he was a shortstop and he struggled then he became an outstanding shortstop then he moved him to second base and i got moved to second base and i couldn't do it and he got moved and won a gold glove so i'm a fan of all the shortstops i'm a big fan of shorts i always look at every shortstop so i'm kind of biased but i like all the shortstops everyone and i like carlos Correa too he uh yeah Pop's a fan. Like when he said Corey Seager, he, he called that. That's like when he first came up and, you know, and, and yeah, Seager was good, but you didn't know how good. And pop Sean said, like, watch, he's like, just watch. And when Sean speaks about the game, you listen, right? Because he knows and he, his eyes are going to tell him something a little bit different than maybe other scouts or coaches. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the reasons why he's such a huge asset to any team that has him in the dugout or around the players. Cause Sean's seen it and his instincts are good. Another thing that Sean said that I love and I tell my kids all the time is he always told me a good month don't make you good and a bad month don't make you bad. So a huge thing that I learned from you, Sean, and I used it as a coach. I think that's so important for, for athletes. Oh, Chop, it's, it's very important because you play one good month does not make a good player. And one bad month 
don't make a bad play. You just got to keep playing. That's why we play six months. That's why you play six months, man. You could be good for three, four months. Then the fifth, sixth is like, wow, what happened? That's why this game is beautiful. And I would play good for three months. Then the next three months, I was terrible. Then the next season start, I'm still terrible for the first three months. And then the next three months, I'm very good. That's how the game is. Everyone can't be Hall of Famers. But I really respect the game, and I play hard, and I'm very thankful. I love that. Coach Ballgame. Well, I can tell why you went into coaching after your playing days were over. You're a fan of players. You love players. You love to see them succeed. Um, and, you you know, I can I can just sense that over a Zoom. When you got to the majors, did you have somebody like yourself, that uh, a mentor, a coach that gave you great advice as you try to make that leap from minor league ball to major league? Uh, ball did you have somebody that that looked after you yes first is my father I mean he got me where I'm at now everything's about my parents everything's about my dad he's my hero he's everything I lost him nine years ago so chop knows how I feel about him I get emotional but my dad is everything but when I got to the big leagues it was Lee Smith Lee Smith took care of me he brought my um he put down the money for my first car he put down a down payment Man, he helped me pay for my first condo. Everything. Lee Smith and his wife Diane took care of me. I owe Lee everything. And then when I made a little bit of money, he said, Lee, you want it back? He said, No, you just take care of the next generation of guys coming up. And I always remember that. And then I got Andre Dawson. So I was very fortunate. I know I'm just throwing out names and Hall of Famers, but anybody know me, man, those are my um, my favorite um people to be around. And they always help me. And I still speak to them today. Wow, Lee Smith. I love that. And um, I don't know why, but Andre Dawson was just, if I had a favorite player, he was my favorite player. And I was number eight because he was number eight. I mean, of course, I loved watching you and Rhino and Grace and everybody, but there was something about Andre that um, I, I think it was that I, I love playing outfield and I love watching him run around the outfield. Um, but what was what was he like? What was Andre like that that I don't know? Um, very intimidating, but very nice, man. He's very nice. He's very intimidating, but very nice. I remember when I first met him, I remember I used to argue with, you know, people in, in the mining because I was a big Andre Dawson fan, and I remember he slumped, and he lost the um, MVP to Dell Murphy, and I got mad. I'm arguing. Everyone's arguing. They go, you can't talk about Andre Dawson around, Sean. Then I finally played against him, and, man, he hit a double. He hit it. In, in the gap and I seen him at second base and he's big and I came by and I said hello and it took him like a minute to say hi and I'm like what's wrong with him but then he said hello he said man keep playing hard he was because he had that deep voice and I always told him I said man I was to fight for you and you're gonna not say hi to me so man we're playing the game and then we became <laughs> teammates and we became my best friend I said, man he's my mentor he helps me out a lot and I just tease him when he became my teammate it's like whoa I said, Rufa, this guy, now he's my teammate, now he's helping me. And I always watched him play because I hurt my back. And I missed two years of playing. But I remember when he hurt his knee, he come in about 7 o'clock in the morning. I mean, we had day games, 7, 7.30 to prepare. And our team doctor, Dr. Shaver, said, I hope you looked at Andre for your whole career while you was there. Watch everything he does. Because you got to understand between the pain, the difference between pain and discomfort. And it's very similar. And Andre was right there, never complained once. So I seen this man, he couldn't bend his knee. And he played. And he played. And I'm like, man, come out the game. Now he won't come out the game. So I tried to pattern myself, but I did come out of the games. My back was hurt. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, uh, amazing. It just And you guys both, when when you could get Andre to smile, and, and you had a great smile, but when you could get Andre to smile, I was like, Whoa, he, he can smile too. It's pretty awesome to see. I, I got to meet him. I, I was lucky enough to throw out the first pitch at Wrigley this past summer. And, yes. and, and um, I was running a, a kid's sandlot in Chicago uh, and I got to see him uh, the day before that he was kind of walking. And my wife's like, you got to go say hello. You got to go mm -hmm. shake his hand. I'm like, I'm not going up to Andre Dawson, <laughs> but I, I walk, I just kind of, walk slowly and finally i i said hey andre my name's james i just want to let you know you're my favorite player uh and he, he said oh thank you very much and i said I, the only thing i could 
think of to legitimize myself was I'm throwing out the first pitch tomorrow here at Wrigley. And mm -hmm. I know he must've been like, really? This guy's throwing out the first pitch at Wrigley? Like, who am I? So, mm -hmm. so I was like, I have to back this up with something. So I said, and I'm going to dedicate the pitch to you. <laughs> <laughs> wow oh, and, yeah. and and, and then question. i and then i immediately think that's not a thing like you don't dedicate <laughs> the first pitch to people but uh, <laughs> i was like ah uh, that's what i did so uh he was so gracious he took a picture with me but um like you said intimidating but so nice and yes. once you're his teammate uh you know he, he's got your back just like lee smith so yes. mm -hmm. pretty cool pretty cool yes. chopper very Thanks. nice man and Sean gives you a glimpse of his loyalty. He talked about, you know, how he was fighting for Andre Dodd. He liked him, and he, and he fought for him. And he fights for his friends. And he fought for me. When I first got on with the Giants on staff, you know, I'm this guy with no major league experience, you know, and Sean had my back, you know. And guys like, why do you like that guy? And, and Sean's like, hey, he, he's smart. He knows what he's talking about. And he, he stood up for me, and he fought for me. And uh, that made my time there uh, obviously more enjoyable, but – easier because Sean had my back and uh, because of him, other people had my back. So thank you, yeah, Sean. Chop, Chop, man, no problem. You was good. You know, I don't know how to hit no fungal like you. <laughs> I don't know how to do that stuff. I don't know how to do the computer. I don't have a problem asking for help. When you're good, you're good. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you play or not. You're good. You're good. That's how it is. That's how you make yourself better. You made me better. I couldn't do the instant replay without you. Everyone knows that. So I appreciate that. You made me look good. So let's no, go. Thank you. That's <laughs> right. Us. And I tell a story because we both had the same birthdays. Yep. Yes. And yeah. I'm hyper and Chop is calm. <laughs> and we missed the first call and I'm panicking and I'm panicking. Chop goes, don't worry about it. I'm like, really, Chop? Really don't worry about it. So don't worry. It's just going to compare us. You know, man, it's just going to prepare us for the World Series. And we're going to get the call right in the World Series. And I'm looking at I'm like, man, that sounds good. But come on, child, this is the big place. This is real. And people, it was the truth. It prepared us for the World Series. And we got the first call right in the World Series. Man. Child, you was right. I never forget <laughs> that. True stories. Not because we just talk. It's a true story. And I still panicked the whole year. But then I calmed down. <laughs> then I calmed down. Oh, Pop, uh, you, I have a question for you, and, okay. and it's and it, we, we're alluding to it, so I know some of these faces are going to be on there, but okay. who is on your teammate Mount Rushmore? So that's four teammates, and you can add a few, too. You played for a long time with a lot of teammates, but if you can narrow it down to four, uh, we're excited to hear them. I can't. I'll be disrespecting them. I, I can't do that. I can't. You know I named two. I played with yeah. Mark Grace. I know you love Mark Grace. Come on, everybody knows. I play with, with Eric Davis. Eric Davis. I play Barry with Bonds. Jim, Barry Bonds. I play with Jim Tomey. Jim Tomey. What the nicest man. Oh, my. Robin Ventura. I can't. I can't. I have too that's many good teammates. Of, yeah. I, no, I have about 50. Whoa, a that's a big teammates. mountain. No, huh? I, right. So I can't disrespect them. No, I can't do that. I can't put nobody in front of the other. No, I can't. I'm sorry. I like it. Hey, that's a good okay. answer. That's, That's a good answer. I play with some good people, not just good baseball players. I play with good people. There's a guy named like Mike Balecki. I have a friend Dave Clark. Oh man, I man, I could go on and on. And Chop, if me and you play, you'd have been one of my favorite teammates. So I always told you that. Thanks, so I had Bob. a lot you of did. good people around me. I had a lot. I can't answer that one. I'm stuck on that one because I don't want to disrespect nobody. That's a great answer. Hunter Pence said the same thing last last week. So that's. Oh, he that's, did. That's a good answer, Pop. Go, honey. All right. I can't. I got one. I can't disrespect him. Maybe you can narrow this one down. The funniest guy you ever played with. Who's the guy that made you laugh or oh. loosen you up uh, in a slump? Oh, I was in a slump every week, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> this guy had to be really funny. <laughs> um, I wow. Well, <laughs> That's a good, <laughs> I don't know, it's everybody. We all, I man, we all crack jokes. But I remember one time when Zimmer um, came out to the mound and it's the ninth inning and it's two outs. And I'm like, man, Zim comes out and he talks to Maddox and he, he said, all right, Maddox, come on, let's get this ground ball. You know, first, right, make him hit it to um, Rhino. I was like, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if you can't hit it to Rhino, hit the grace. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. And then he go, 
If you can't hit the right on the grace, make them pop it up there, Sean. I said, absolutely. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that loosened me up because uh, he's thinking the same thing. I'm thinking, I know I'm a short stuff, but do I really want this right now? I'm, you know, I was a little nervous, but that loosened me up. So my manager, Zim, the players, is everybody. I had a good time. I had a how, good about time Maddox, how about Maddox when you'd make an error and you'd say, oh, don't worry about it, Pop. That's unearned. It's all right. Oh, yeah, man. I'm upset because errors irritate me. I'd rather strike out. Yes. And make an error. I mean, I don't like errors because I feel like I'm letting down the whole team. A strikeout is fine because the strikeout's on me. But when I make an error, I feel like I'm letting the team down and Maddox see that I'm upset. And he's right screaming at me, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. The runs are unearned. So don't worry about it. <laughs> made me mad. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's so funny. But that's, he said, don't worry about it. Sean. Yeah, it's okay, Bob. Unearned. Yeah. I didn't know that because, you know, like three, four runs scored, you know, I'm like, hey, after then I'm sitting on the bench, I'm pissed, come by, hey, don't worry about it, the runs are unearned, don't worry about it. I said, oh, really, I'm getting all upset for this. I didn't know this, but I love to play and I really enjoy Greg Maddox. And he's Man, loyal. So hey, coach ball game. You, I mean, he, that's sincere when he says, if I strike out, that's on me. Okay, like, I'll, I'll deal with it. And he's got these big shoulders, but if he lets down his teammates or his pitcher, that's hard for him. You know what I mean? Because that's who he is. You know, so he feels like he's letting people down. That's just a glimpse of Sean's character. He's the best pop. Uh, well, we were just talking about like um, kids that we coach and I coach very young kids. Uh, Chopper's a little bit older and, and, you know, you obviously coach at the major league level, um, but uh, players get performance anxiety where it, it, if it's practice, they're, they're letting it rip and it's, they're, they're at ease. But I have a lot of players, once you turn the scoreboard on or the umpires out there, then it, they turn into a different person. You, do you have any advice for that player out there? Oh, you got, anxiety? oh you got to take the practice with it. I had a lot of anxiety. Yeah, I was nervous. When the nervous goes away, it's time to leave. Yeah. It's time to stop playing. I was always nervous. I mean, my wife used to say, watch me on TV. She said, please hit the first ball to Sean. Please hit the first ball to me. To get my nerves right, I was uptight. I'm, I'm just hyper chops the opposite he's relaxed he's laughing and joking i go chop this is the big league ah don't worry about it <laughs> i like to be around people the opposite of me that's where i learn from but anxiety is good but you got to calm it down you have to calm it down you have to calm that anxiety means that you care yeah it means you care so when the caring stops you got to go i mean just keep doing it. the more you play it will go away the more yeah. you play it and once it's like you go, time, it's time to go home. Uh, it's like time heals all pain and experience kind of, kind of it heals that, that the jitters, uh, you know, just being in those moments. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. Chopper, what else and, you got? And chew gum. Pop, you know, pop, like you got to chew gum. Like, yeah, you, go, <laughs> you get dry mouth. Oh, yeah. Your fans don't know about all that. Yeah, that's why I chew gum. Oh, yeah, I chew gum. Not to be too. Tastes good, too, now. Don't get me sure. wrong. That's why guys have gum in their mouth. You get that cotton in your mouth. You go, oh, boy, what's going on? The game's a little different when you're on the field and when you're looking from the stands. It's completely different. Completely. Well, I just made a video about yeah, gum. You did. Well, yeah. gum, like, um, I'll say, kids, why do you want to chew gum during a game? It makes the other player think that you know something they don't know. And it makes you, it makes you seem more relaxed than you really are. So there's actually something to that. You know, where, you know, you're just chewing this thing in your mouth and it makes you seem like uh, you've got it all under control. So uh, that could be a wow, good tool. I did not have it all under control. I did not. <laughs> I did not. It looks like it, Pop. We're not saying you had it. It's like a duck. I no, everybody like it. knows me. Yeah. So I did not have it under control. It's like a, I heard someone once say like a duck. They feel like a duck where they look calm, right, on the water mm -hmm. on the surface. But mm -hmm. underneath, their legs are going a mile a minute, right? That's so, me. Yeah, that's all. That's most of us. Yeah, okay. that's that's dealing with that anxiety. But I like what but that's said. not the players like Ryan Sandberg, right? Buster Posey, Buster, Andre Dawson. Everything's calm. Brandon Crawford, Crawford. Yeah. Calm. calm, calm. See, those are good players. They slow the game down. The game was real fast. The game got slower to me when I finished playing. Yeah, <laughs> when I finished playing. Yeah. But that's why those guys are really good and they Hall of Famous for a reason. Barry Bonds, slow. Everything is in slow motion to them. Mike Trout, slow motion to me is speeded up. Now, when it's slow for me, that's when I was hot. I was probably for a 
couple of days or a couple of weeks and the game was real easy, then then became hard again. But How'd I just sleep. How'd you sleep on those nights, Pop, when it was going good? Oh man, I slept like a baby. Oh <laughs> man, things go good. I slept like a baby. When you don't hit, things irritate you. I roll over in the bed and like I look at the clock. It's only nine o'clock. We got a day game. It's nine o'clock at night. I roll over again. It's only 10. I'm like, man. Come on, wait for the next day. But when you're hitting good, you just sleep, wake up, and just go to the park and play. Did you, wasn't it you in the dugout with Barry where you 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 joked about how he sleeps at night versus you? Was that you yeah. or who was that? No, Tony Gwynn. Tony Not Gwynn. Tony Gwynn. After Tony Gwynn sleeps like a baby. I'm rolling over and everything. Everyone's laughing at me. But half the players in the big leagues was doing what I'm doing. No doubt. No, Buster didn't sleep like that. Buster slept like Barry. Um... Piazza, let me see. <laughs> yeah. Old Rude. Let me Old see. Rude. Oh, man, all the great plays, they all slip alike. And all of us in between, they know what I'm talking about. Oh, they yeah. know. Yeah, Joe Panic always likes to say, uh, if he can salvage a day, right? If you're 0 for 3, you can get that base hit, and it's a 1 for 4, you're going to sleep a little bit better because that average isn't going to drop quite as much. It's You saved the day with that 1 for 4, and you can go on to the next day. Joe's That's real. Yes, and the good players, even the ones who are the great players, they go, you know, if I could get that one walk, well, I didn't walk. So it's either right. 0 for 4, most of the time it's 0 for 4, or 1 for 4, but most of the time it was 0 for 4. Yep. And it's kind of hard to sleep. And they go, wow, you know, make all that money. No, you don't understand. It's because we care. That's right. It's because we care. We're not thinking about money. We're thinking about getting hits and performing. And but once you get that SAB, yeah. you feel good. Yeah, you feel yeah. real good. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Question I have for you, Pop. Uh, you played the game hard. And in my opinion, you played the game the right way. You mm -hmm. hustled. Uh, mm -hmm. Why did you play the game that way? Why was that the way you played it? Was that taught to you? Or was that just, wh where'd that come from? Well, it was taught to me. Uh, one day I'm watching TV and I'm I'm a young kid and I'm watching the Reds and I don't like him because I'm a Met fan and I watch Pete Rose and he gets the base in, and he's running around the bases flying. He hit a ground ball, the second base, and he's running hard. And why is he doing that? Then I remember how McCray took out Willie Randolph at second base, playing hard. I remember George Brett was hitting like 390 and hit a routine ground ball to second base. And he ran real, real hard. And he almost beat it out. I was like, wow, he can't really run. Why is he hustling? That took to me. And those are superstar players. So I said to myself, I want to play like that. And it stuck with me, those three players. And when I seen them do it, I said, well, if they could do it, I could do it. Well, and you can control your effort. Yes. You, can, you can't control it, you're going to get hits. Yes, I try to get hits all the time. But if I hit a ground ball, there's two reasons why I ran hard. Besides that was because, one, I could run. And two, I'm pissed off. So I want them, I want them to feel like I feel. I want them to make an error and throw the ball away for they could feel like me. So that's why I always played hard, always competed. But those three players was the guys that made me always um and play hard every game it was Pete Rose, Hal McCray, and George Brett. Never forget well, you, those guys. You know why George Brett was able to run hard uh that year. He was hitting 390 pop, so he was getting good sleep at night. I know yeah. he was getting good sleep, but <laughs> shop. No, you, I know what you're saying. I'm joking. And when you're three for three, you don't. Yeah, you don't hard. need to run hard. You're three for four. Yeah. I yeah. Know. So what is he doing? And that impressed me so yeah. much. That that right there. Most kids or people like the backflips, like guys right. who do things. Yeah. That impressed me. And I told you there was a guy in the Dodgers where he said, "Remember I said that about uh, Muncie? Yeah. Yeah. He ran out of ground ball. Yes. That impressed me. That was like, whoa. And then I remember Kershaw did that. Yeah. That impressed me. And that stuff like that. When Buster do it, it's like, Buster, you catching. What are you doing? We need you. and he runs our ground balls. That impressed me. Things like that impressed me. I know those are ball plays. That's my opinion. That's why we man, we all love Buster. But Buster's not my favorite player in the Giants. It's Crawford. It's Crawford. Ah. It's Crawford. <laughs> well, Hunter Pence last week talked about making the other team feel him. Like when, when he's running down the bases, he wants his feet heard. He wants to put that little 
rock in their shoe, like, hmm, I better get on this because he's going to beat this play out. And then, you know, that brings anxiety to the other players on the other team. So, um, mm -hmm. A, like you said, it's memorable. You remember those players that did those mm -hmm. things um, because they look like ball players, they're grinders. But, man, if I'm playing shortstop and I get a ball in, in the hole and that I know that runner is – if I can feel that runner – Man, it makes that throw a little harder. So absolutely, Hunter's one of those players. We know who the players who hustle and who don't. I won't mm -hmm. mention. I answer the players who hustle. Yeah, Hunter was one of them. When you, man, you better be ready. Even the routine you booted, oh, that's not a good feeling because you're going to beat it out. <laughs> Where other players, well, they're already pissed, so they're not going to run out. So it helps you be a better shortstop. No, I like those players like Hunter. I ain't like playing against them, but I did appreciate it. Though. I yep. Did. Mm -hmm. Well, I. I uh... I have some segments uh, uh, that, that I like to do in these podcasts. And one is, is a trivia contest. Ooh. And this is Sean Dunstan trivia. Oh, and it's yeah. going to be, it's going to be pops versus coach chop. Ooh. And this is all <laughs> pop, all, pop uh, and chop, pop okay. and chop and chop. And, right. and as soon as, if you, if you just yell the answer out, as soon as you think, you know it, and you get, multi, you know, if you don't get it right the first time, keep trying. Okay. Okay. If you both can't get it, then I get the point. Okay. But uh, uh, question number one, uh, Sean had 150 career home runs. What pitcher did he hit the most home runs off of? Ryan Dolan. Correct. One yeah, nothing. Yeah, Pop. <laughs> yeah, you did. I remember Ryan Dolan. Yes, I'm, I didn't have a high batting average. I did not. But for some reason, his home was open. He was tough. The whole Mets pitching staff was tough. But Ron Darling gave a, probably the most home runs to me. And I think next would have been Doug Drabeck, I think. I like facing him. He was good. I mean, probably those two pitches, I think, the most I hit. Um, Ron Darling made me Doug Drabeck. But they always yeah, got me out. I, hey, Pop. I, uh, I, I had, go ahead, oh, Coach yeah, Paul, Go ahead. ahead. Well, I, I was I saying, Doug Drabeck, uh, you had – he you faced him the most. You, yeah, you had – you 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 had the most at bats, faced him the most. I think it was seventy times you faced Doug Graveck. So that was yeah, I think I hit two or three home runs. I think so. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, hey, Pop, did you mm -hmm. own? Did who owned who? Did you own Oral Hersizer or did he own you? It's it's funny. I always tell you that story. I know. Oral Hersizer <laughs> owned me. Yeah. But people, I think I got up like forty times and. I think I'm hitting 330 against him or 328 or 330. But I think I have no doubles, no triples, no home runs. And he walked me a couple of times because I think he had to, to intentionally walk me because of the pitcher behind me. So I have a nice batting average, yeah. a nice on base percentage, but my slugging is terrible. And I have no RBIs. As a hitter, you want RBIs. So he owned me. So what he did was, with no men on base, he just threw it right straight down the middle to get me out. So now with men in scoring position, I feel real good. I got him, and he carved me up. That's how basically he carved me up. He made me so mad. I'm still mad at those pitchers. They use the hit. Yeah, it's the truth. If you look at my, I have no RBIs against him. But how you hit three thirty three or forty? I have no RBIs. So he owned me. I did not right. own him. I mean, he was playing with me. That's how I look. <laughs> oh, man. This is good. I, 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 I got to get back to asking the questions. You're going to take all my uh, you're going to take all my answers away. Um, let's go to if one nothing pops. Um, three of the 150 home runs that Sean hit were walk offs, three walk off Ooh. home runs. What runner was on base for his first walk off home run in 1990? Oh, I forgot. I remember that. That was, was the first it, game of a doubleheader against the Pirates. It was at it was at Jerome Wrigley. At Wrigley Jerome Field. Jerome Ooh, Jerome I'm gonna say correct. Ah, uh, um, it's 1990. Grace, correct. Two ah, nothing. Oh. <laughs> so Grace was on base. Craig Lefferts was the pitcher for the Padres uh, yes. at Wrigley. You also hit walk offs against uh, Philly and Pittsburgh. Um, Philly, nice. it was at home. Um, I guess and Pittsburgh might have been Slocum. away. Yeah, that was Correct. Slocum. Slocum. Correct. And when I was with the Cardinals, I had a walk-off against the Pirates. 
and the pitch. I don't know. Maybe I think it's my friend Christensen. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'll sure. have awesome. to check. Uh, okay. Two nothing pops. Ch- Chad, mm. you okay? We 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 played this game with <laughs> Joe Buck, good. and Joe Buck beat him bad too. He's he, he's hey. okay finishing second. I told you, hey, Pop, I told him before, we, we were talking before, pre before you came on, and I said, hey, I promise I'll finish in the top two. So I'm doing good. I'm right where I need to okay. be. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, he, hit five, he, he hit five grand slams in his career. Who's the guy that was on base for two of those? And there's, there's two guys. All right, so you can pick either one. But for two of the five grand slams, this guy was on base. Nice. That's tough. I remember. I've heard they, one. I've heard his name already today. Jerome Walton. Incorrect. Mark Grace. Incorrect. Gosh. Joe Girardi. I wanted to say Girardi. No. No. Uh, no. He's on that. Uh, so you, uh, they're on a different <laughs> team. You were playing for a different team. There's your hand. Oh, Barry Bonds. I was playing, I was playing for a different team. Well, Incorrect. Well, 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 well. Okay, Eric Davis. Correct. Hey. Eric um, was on for two of them and another Cardinal. I was back down. Oh. I hope it was Edmonds. Edmonds was on for one of them, but okay. Eric Davis and Big Mac were on Big for Mac. two of them. Ooh, McGuire. Oh, yeah, that made me feel good. Man, that, made me feel <laughs> <laughs> that made me feel I, was, I wasn't batting eight, but I was probably batting six that day. Tony made yeah. me really feel good. Tony had a good matchup for you. Yeah. You love yes. playing for Tony, right, Pop? Yes. I say Tony was analytics. Yes. Mm. Then, now. So he did all that stuff. Yes. There's no way I'm batting behind Big Mac. If I'm batting behind Big Mac, he ain't getting nothing to hit. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Him and Jim Emmons ain't getting in nothing to hit. Period. <laughs> um, you, you didn't walk much, but uh, uh, who who walked you the most of any other pitcher? And oh. the number is four. This guy walked you four times. That uh, that is the uh, the most anybody walked you. Oh. And I've heard his name already. Dre Beck. I'm going to go with Dre Beck because he faced him a lot. Good guess. Incorrect. Yeah. Faced him a lot, but didn't walk as How much about Ryan as... It was Oral. Oral. I was just going to say that. Oh. Oh. I was going to say that. You said he walked you intentionally a few That's times. Right. So was it, they all intentionally. He didn't walk me. <laughs> <laughs> all he did not. No, that don't count as a walk. It's called intentional. He could have got me out of any time he wanted to, but it was a pitcher behind me. If it was a hitter behind me, he would have carved me up. Like I said, last one here, last okay. one. And then uh, I'll, I'll, I need some daddy daughter advice from you. So I, that's my okay. question for you after this. Cause I got two daughters. Um, most runs batted in, and this is a hall of famer. Who, what pitcher did you have the most RBIs off of? And your hint is he's in the hall of fame. John Smokes. Correct. I dominated. I, you dominated, no, Pop. No, I, no, I'm saying you dominated it. me in this game. Oh, oh, that, oh <laughs> Smokes, no, I didn't dominate. Well, the first time we faced each other, I think it was 19, I had two home runs off him. I had two home runs off him. And he had fastball, he had a curveball, he had a slider. But he didn't know I couldn't hit a slider, so he didn't yeah. throw it. After he knew I couldn't hit a slider, I had, no, I had trouble with him. I had trouble. Yeah, say, he probably I threw really you a fastball. Yeah. yeah, he threw me yeah. off fastball. I mean, fastball curveball. You get a fastball, Pop. You right. get a fastball. I had a fastball and I had the curveball because my bad and eighth, even though I hated it, it taught me how to hit a breaking ball. Mm-hmm. But it didn't teach me how to hit a slider. <laughs> and <laughs> his slider was nasty. He he was yeah. man, very tough. I like competing against him. He come right at you. he hit it. Not a show off. Just a pleasure man to face him, but I ain't like him because he got me out a lot. But the first day I loved him. Oh, and and, pop, that, and that, yeah. yeah, and Pop's bat speed, like he it he, he still has it. So like he always said it. And and even when we were together, Sean with the Giants, they would turn that machine up and pop like throw it as fast as you want. He mm-hmm. could still turn it around. He can turn around yeah. a fastball. You you got a triple digit fastball, throw it. Sean's ready. Okay. He's just the but, slider pop. And then everyone tell you, well, don't swing at it. Pop says, It looks like a fastball. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think I'm swinging at it? 
<laughs> yes, it looks easy. Then they tell you about the red dot. Uh, I ain't yeah. got time to look for Nobody. no red dot. I'm looking at the object. No, it just sounds good. No, no, my nerves is uptight. Maybe they seen it. I didn't, but yeah. I don't. No, I didn't see it. No, I just, I'm not afraid to say I, I couldn't hit a slider. The slider is a nasty pitch, and it still gives me nightmares. You know, yeah. sliders do. Sliders still gives me nightmares. Like when I'm sleeping, and my wife sees me like jumping in my sleep, and she said, "You played <laughs> last." Night. I said, "Yeah, I struck out twice." Yeah, I struck. <laughs> I, yeah, because I'm jumping. If I'm smiling in my sleep. Oh, I said, you smile. I said, yeah, I got a couple of hits. I got a couple yeah. of hits. Ah, yes, I got a couple great. of hits. I still think baseball. I love baseball. I love oh, baseball man. and I appreciate baseball. Oh, man. I had a roommate in college uh, and, and he actually got kicked out of the game that day for arguing a, 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 a strike call. And mm -hmm. we're, uh, you know, it's midnight and I wake up and he's over in his bed yelling in his sleep, that ball's out, Blue. That ball's outside, Blue. <laughs> no, it's true. I jump in my sleep, it's, it's, and my wife looks at me, and if I'm jumping, I'm not having a good game. If I'm smiling <laughs> in my sleep, she said, you're smiling in your sleep. So he's smiling. I said, you know, I was probably playing. I got a couple of hits. Yes, it's still with me. Yes. So that's why, I, like, when I coach, I felt the players when they was over. I felt that, and it just took me back to me playing. So that's why I appreciate all the San Francisco Giants players. When we won the World Series, oh, I was so happy for them because I lost one, and it hurt. And you do not, do not want to lose a World Series to stay with you. I mean, I told Chop, the first World Series he won as a team in 10, nah, it's all right. It was nice. Then 12. I said, okay, then 14. It took me three World Series championships to be part of, to get over the one I lost. It took three of them, but I tell every player, like I tell Chop, I'll be happy to give back all three of my rings as a coach and win one as a player. That is absolutely the truth. So players, don't take this for granted when you go to the World Series and if you lose, oh, we'll be back here next year. No, it don't work that way. No, it did not work that way. Important what you said, Sean, for our coaches that are listening to this podcast and even our parents. You just said as a coach, you had that empathy or you could feel when the players failed. So as a coach, instead of yelling at a kid when he makes a mistake, yes. feel the pain that they're feeling and have empathy for them. And you're going to talk to them differently and your tone's going to be different if you're feeling their pain instead of yes. you're disappointed in them because they let you down. Feel their pain and love them yes. through those failures. Yes, it hurts. Yeah, because you played and you understand it. It's like, it's not a nice feeling. No, yeah. no. It, just, it sticks with you. You see yeah. a guy struggling, man, you want to help him. Just help him and be there. But I had one coach, is my favorite, is John Vukovic and Tony Franklin. And John Vukovic, I play and I make an error. I had a tough game. He said, man, we had a bad game. I mean, we, we had a bad game. Then when I have a good game, he said, you had a good game. So I try to coach that way. So when your player's struggling, we had a bad game. As a mm. team, we had a bad game. But when the player does well, it's the player. But when the player really knows it's us. Because the coach, man, you really don't want the glory. You want them to um, play well and do well. So I try to coach that way and play that way. When I failed, he said, we. He didn't want my glory. He wanted my failure. But to me, I want him to have my glory with me. Yeah, powerful. That's beautiful, man. That's awesome. Well, the this moment didn't make you cry. Well, maybe it did make you cry. Uh, tears of joy. Your daughter uh, was oh. recently named the White <laughs> so Sox cool. new yeah. director of minor league operations. Um, yeah. I, I, wow. I, I have a question for you, but first, okay. I mean, what was that moment like when you found out that your daughter is is a White Sox director of minor league operations? I still can't believe it. And I go, I, like I did, um, actually, you said, what? Yeah. You said, what? I said, you, I'm like, huh? I said, are you serious? And she's laughing. I said, I'm, I'm very serious. I'm not joking. There's nothing to be playing around with. This is serious. And, and I broke down. I said, damn. <laughs> I cried a little bit. I said, well, he was listening to daddy when I was talking to little Sean every day about baseball. He said, daddy, I had no choice. I said, well, you had a choice. You could have left. But she listened. And I'm so proud of her. And Chop knows, I don't know about all those jobs, right. but I know what they mean. And I know it's very important. I said, wow. 
because I like minor league players. Because when I came up, I was a bonus baby and I couldn't do no wrong in the minor leagues. And, you know, usually when you're the first rounder, they give you a chance to be a player in the major leagues. And I tell players, of course, you're first round. It means that they give you a longer look to show that you can't play. So look at not just the first rounds, look at all the rounds because you got good players. Because my good buddy, Mark Grace, was drafted in the 20th round, 24th round, and he was a better player than me. So it does not matter what round. And I told him, yes, I'm so proud. I was like, I still can't believe in it, but I, man, I'm very thankful. I thank the White Sox, and maz- but mainly Major League Baseball. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Well, I, I, I've got an eight and a four-year-old daughter, and uh, I, I, I'd love to ask you, what is the advice you'd give me as a, as a, a father of, of daughters you know, that um, – Maybe somebody gave you uh, when when your kids were young, or or you figured out the hard way. But what's some good daddy daughter advice from Sean Dunstan? I got it from my father, and I retired, and he's talking to me, and he goes, "Son, you got to talk to your daughters different than your son. It's okay for you to talk to your son like you at the ballpark." but you cannot talk to your daughters that way. And I'm like, yeah, okay, okay. But when my wife said it, it hit me. She said, Sean, you can't talk to your daughters, Whitney, Jazz, or Aisha, like you talk to Sean Jr. Because the women are gonna let it go in and go out and they many different. And I'm at home when I retire and I'm like, man, it's like the mood swings of women. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? It's like they stay in their room for about 10 hours and they come downstairs and they don't talk. And that was a big adjustment for me as major league players. And it was tough. And I think my wife, I think my dad and my wife, when she said it, it hit me. And I said, well, you like that? I said, no, they're different. And I understood. It took me two years to understand that. Two years. And let me explain something to you. Daughters need their fathers. And just telling you, because when you get older, they're going to take care of you. But you got to be a good listener. I wasn't a good listener at first. In baseball, I'm a good listener, but I have an opinion, but I listen a lot. But with your daughters, you have to be a good listener. And if they wrong, it's okay to be wrong. If your son's wrong, correct him. Your daughters, <laughs> listen, because if you don't listen to them, they're not going to talk to you. So for us men, we have to be good listeners. It's not about being right or wrong. That's, God, it's not about right or wrong. You can't treat them like you're a ball player. And I was a ball player like half my life. So listen to them. And when you're listening, you learn a lot. That's, a, that's a lot. great. I love that. I, I uh, shared this last podcast my eight-year-old's very strong-willed and I've never been able to get her to submit just, just, just to say I was right. And, and she was wrong. She, she just won't, she won't say that, but what you just said there, that that's not the point. The one time I got her to just say, I'm sorry, dad, I'll try to do better was after I apologized to her for getting a little upset. I got a little, yes. you know, a little too loud, got a little too mm-hmm. mad and, and I knew it. And I was like, I'm, I'm too loud right now. I gotta, I gotta let her know I, I messed up. I'm sorry. And that was mm-hmm. the first time she opened up to me. So it really yeah. felt like we, we got somewhere. You um, got the answers right there. It's the wife. She tells you, my daughter Jasmine was like that, all of them. And she's very smart. And I had the list. You got to take a step back. Yeah. You got to say, I'm a feminist. Yes, I am. Chop knows I'm a feminist, but you got to listen to them. Yeah. They're very smart, but the emotional part, oh, you got to deal with it as part of being a parent. You got to take the good with the bad. But I always told my daughter, like, when you're in sports, you got to understand the difference between criticism and constructive criticism. And then she told me, Daddy, that's the same way for you, too. And that hit, and I knew exactly what she meant. But mm. it's good to be a father. It's like Kobe with the daddy girl. Man, it's good to be a daddy with daughters. Oh, yeah. They're going to take care of you. They love you. You, you, 
I mean, you are their first love. Don't you ever forget that. Just like with a young man, a young boy, their mom is their first love. My first love is my mother. Like, I mean, it's okay to talk about my daddy. You could talk bad about my daddy. I could care less. Don't talk about my mother. Every young man does not talk about their mother. That's how it is. It's the opposite. And I had yeah. to learn, and I'm still learning. And now we have an empty nest, and it's just me and my wife, and we got to start all over. We boyfriend and girlfriend all over. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, awesome. Well, enjoy that. I, I don't have anything else. My my heart is full, uh, and I just I thank you for sharing some time with us and and making the the eight year old me um, just man feel really really good. So thank you, Sean uh, Chopper. You can you can close us out. I got one more question, Pop. I think it's important. Uh, okay. What advice would you give a young athlete who wants to play in the big league someday? What's what's mm. what's one thing or a couple things that that you can say helped you in your journey? Um, what what is it? What you know? What's something you could tell them? Or what's something you told Sean Jr. Your you know your son? Oh, Sean is going to do yeah. not give up. If you have a passion, don't give up. Do not give up. A lot of people are gonna always tell you you're not good enough because really they don't want you to be there because they're not there and they don't want you to be there. Do not give up. This game is easy. Um, it's easy to the point where everything is going well. When things are not going well, that's not man, no good. Always have a passion for what you do and believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. My son is going to, don't give up, son, you love it, play, 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 and understand who are the good people around you and the people who are not. You got to pick out who's the good coaches and who's the bad coaches. It's bad and all and good and all. But if you love baseball, still play. I want to play. If I tell all you young kids right now, I am so, so jealous of every kid that's five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, <laughs> and make the biggest in, in ages, because they can still play. Because you know why? Because I can't play no more. Do you think I want to play? Yes, but I can't. You have everything there. And one more thing, listen to your parents. They're not going to lie to you. Listen to your parents. That's how I made it. I listened to my parents and then I came across good people who thought like my parents and led me the right way. Listen to your parents, please. Listen to your parents. What they say, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. my kids, they didn't look at me as a baseball player. I was just loud daddy. Can't play no more, has been. Because I am, I'm a has been. But I'm daddy and I'm there for you. Your parents will always be, be there for you, whether you're right or wrong. So your parents is the main thing. For me, it's your parents. After that, it's the teachers, the coaches. Be honest with them. Be honest. I was honest. I can't hit the slider. What's wrong with that? Everyone can. I get a hanging one. But why they don't hang it to me? Why they only <laughs> hang it to the good players? Because the good players don't swing at the ones in the dirt. So, no, just be honest. Do not give up. If you have a passion, play. And when, when, when one person says you can't play, don't believe that. No. And listen, one other thing. When someone say you're great and you're great, no, you're not. Believe half of it. And when they say you bad and you stink, believe half of it. Not all <laughs> of it. Half of it on both of them. And you'll be all right and stay well grounded. And have good friends like Chop. Chop didn't play in the big leagues, and I'm pissed. I wish you would, because we'd have been best friends in the big leagues. Instead of me hitting 269, I probably would hit 290. Yeah. <laughs> I don't hey, know about walking. Hey, I like, I, I just remembered something. You told me a lot that you would tell kids. You're talking about parents, right? And a, and a kid would say, like, oh, my dad this, my dad. You said, hang on a second now. Who would step in front of a bullet? Right. Sure. Right. Your yes, father absolutely. and your mother. Yeah. So don't yeah. forget that, kids. Like, as parents, we would do anything for our kids. So you know that if mom and dad are being tough, you want to. I remember that you said that and it stuck. Yes, it right? sticks. Well, it's it's true. I mean, true. if a bullet was coming at these children, at the son and the dad, I wouldn't step in front. Right. The dad wouldn't even think about it. He'd step in front. 
Yeah. So why are you going to listen to me? And then, it, it, and if the kid asks me, I'll ask the kid, um, sir, why won't child, why won't you step in front of the bullet for my son? Because you're going to say I got to step in front for my son. That's right. I got four babies. That's, That's right. right. You got to step yeah. in front. So. Yeah. Listen to your parents. <laughs> That's right. That's the moral of that story. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Listen to your parents. Well, hey, wow. Pop, we're so thankful that you're here and send all of our love, the Chops love to you and mm -hmm. Tracy and, and your beautiful babies. And we're so proud of Jasmine. And we're Thank proud of uh, Sean you. Jr. still grinding and love that and all your babies there. I mean, Coach you. Boggan, his family is just the best. Mm -hmm. and, and Tracy's the best. And like, Sean, you say this and I say this about my kids when they say, oh, you have good kids. I go, no, no, that's my yeah. wife. Because yeah. we're out working and, and, and our wife. wives that's right so it's not you're, me you're, no yeah. no it's not chop it's the wife the wife goes through a lot because they have to you know take the 0 for 4 with us and the 0 for 5 and they got to take care of kids and like i tell everybody my wife and i have four kids but my wife has five children yes <laughs> yeah, that's right my wife has She's five the best. children tracy's it's the best. best she's the queen i love, I love, you, love you child too, I remember that day like we was in arizona and the family came in town and they seen me, they all ran up to me. Oh, yeah. It made me feel good. But I was jealous because my kids are grown. Yeah. So enjoy it, child. While they're young, they get quick. Man, hey, they get older quick and they leave. Oh. They don't want to be around you. <laughs> you ready? Hey, hey, Pop, are you golfing yet? You pick up any no. golf clubs yet? Ah. No, I will go to the golfing range with you. All right. I will go. That's the deal. You know, I'm retired and I'm looking for friends. <laughs> We love you, Pop. Thank you so much you for too. taking the time. I love You're you, Chuck. All right, Thank have you. a great day. See you All later. Right, take care. I love you. Tell everybody hi. Don't forget to rake, everybody. And a boy, Chopper. 